Uh, welcome everyone to the Zoology 101 panel. This is led by our guest of honor, Dr. Wildlife, who is a PhD zoologist, and they will be going through a bit of a crash course on all things zoology. So if you're all ready, Dr. Wildlife, I'll let you take over. So just by a show of hands, and wow, I guess I talk a little louder than him. <laughs> Sorry, A.B. Uh, how many people, one, were old enough to come to Drunk Zoology last night, and two, actually did come to Drunk Zoology? Okay, cool. So I always like to ask that question because I just want to make sure that um, not a lot of people are like just hearing repeated information. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, like Giza was saying, my name is Dr. Wildlife. Um, my tagline is the furry fandom's resident zoologist. It, I used to joke around when people asked me what I do in the fandom, and I would say that sometimes I post cool animal facts, and people seem to like them. And uh, judging by the turnout to all of these panels, I, I think that's really true, that some people seem to enjoy seeing all the nerdy content that I put out. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to try and cram a whole semester course of zoology into this one hour panel. Do you guys think we can do that? Yeah? We're going to try. Now trust me, there's a lot of big topics in the field of zoology and some of this I'm just going to be like, say one sentence about it and we're going to move on and your brain's going to start smoking. You'll be like, wait, I have so many questions about that. And uh, that's normal. <laughs> That's completely fine. Um, basically what these slides are is I've essentially taken the class that I used to teach at a university level and I've made it into like a furry friendly slideshow. Um, I also do teach this, if you're young enough, I teach it on OutSchool, which is a virtual learning platform and I teach it for ages uh, 14 to 18 on there. Uh, for adults and anybody that doesn't want to go on OutSchool, I do regularly teach it through Twitch as well. Now there may be some of you that have no idea who I am, that's completely fine, or even those of you that do know who I am probably don't know com the complete story of how I got to this point, um, but this is little old me. Somehow I had blondish hair back then, and I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, but I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas down a, a dirt road. I grew up on a trailer, and we had tons of animals all around us. And there was chickens, ducks, horses, cows, all sorts of things. And from those little humble beginnings, I had a, a big attachment to animals and I always knew that I wanted to work with them. I just, at that point, didn't really quite know how. And it kind of manifested in my head as I wanted to be a veterinarian. I went on into... Uh, undergrad with that in my head, but it wasn't until I started working in the world of zoos and aquariums that I realized I wanted to do stuff like this. I wanted to do science communication and conservation and zoo management. So fast forward about 13 years or so, um, I'm now the manager of an accredited zoo just outside of Toronto, Canada. We focus on uh, reptiles mainly, so things from pythons to lizards to our Nile crocodiles, which are pretty cool. But oddly enough, my specialty is in big cats, hence the tiger character, which is uh, very far removed from crocodiles, I would say. And obviously, there's some of you that probably have a lot of questions about my career, but I do have a panel later tonight that goes more specifically into that and how you can kind of follow that path. But for today, we're going to get into zoology. So I have a question here. What is life? What would you define life as? Does anyone want to try and guess what that could be? 42. 42. Oh, my God. So I just have to throw something out there. Uh, how many of you were in the fursuit group photo earlier? You know the 360 camera that kept popping up? Did that remind anybody of those little creatures from Hitchhiker's Guide that, like, pop up out of the dirt and, like, slap them around and then go back down? I was losing my mind. A.V., that was the funniest thing. I was, like, losing my mind. That's all I could see when it would pop up and then pop back down. So, anyway, that doesn't answer that question. That's just a fun anecdote about today. So, a lot of people have different ways that they interpret what life is. We define it in a lot of different ways. But at its root, it is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. 
And this is where I usually lose people because that's a very technical term. Some people would say it's anything that moves or anything that, that breathes. But of course, and this is not me trying to like make uh, Katy Perry references, but a plastic bag could drift through the wind and it's technically moving. That doesn't make it alive. It's plastic. So it has to be a self-sustaining chemical system that is capable of evolving over time. And of course, there's a lot of information on this. I'm not expecting people to take notes. There's no exam at the end of this, unless you want there to be. But all life has um, essentially seven different basic properties, and they range in complexity along the way. But essentially, some, some biggest takeaways from this is that uh, life is able to reproduce in some way. Um, life grows and develops, so we don't always, depending on the animal, we don't always start out as the same thing from the beginning all the way to adulthood. All life is capable of energy processing, and put simply, sometimes that means bear eats fish, or it could be plant takes in sun. We respond to the environment. We regulate. In some ways, like us, uh, we self-regulate our body temperature because we're mammals. For reptiles, regulation means moving from hot to cold, depending on their body. And ultimately, all life is capable of evolutionary adaptation. Now, when we talk about life, and as we go through these slides, I'm going to be referencing a lot of things from taxonomy. And as I've told my students that take this class, taxonomy could be a class on its own. You could spend a whole semester talking about the naming of animals and and how they got those names. Um, it, it, it's very complex. But in terms of the world of zoology, we're focused on just one kingdom, and that is the animal kingdom, or animalia. And there's all sorts of multiple different groupings along the way within taxonomy. Kingdom is the biggest grouping. Phylum is the next biggest. And that is the section that we'll be talking about a lot as we go through these different groups. I posed this question in my panel last night, so some of you probably already know the answer, or you just know it outside of panels, but why should we learn scientific names instead of common names? Anyone want to shout that out? I heard something. Hmm? There's too many common names. It's, it's very, very confusing, and this animal here is a perfect example. So. You don't have to raise your hands for this. It's something that I just enjoy hearing people just shout out. But um, could anyone tell me what you know this animal by? <laughs> so do you guys hear yourself? Like, do you hear how many different <laughs> do you hear how many different names are going around this room? So this animal here, its scientific name is Puma concolor. They're found all the way at the top of Canada, all the way down to the bottom of South America, everywhere in between. There was all sorts of different people that have encountered this animal along the way. Not only people that spoke English, but there was people that spoke Spanish, Portuguese, and all sorts of native languages along the way. And they all called it different things. Some of the most common names for it are mountain lion, puma, cougar, but there's also some weird ones like catamount, and mountain screamer, and those are all regional differences. So they hold the Guinness Book World Record for the animal with the most number of names. And this is just one example of why we use scientific names as zoologists to communicate about these animals, because there's only one, typically, <laughs> there's a few weird cases, but typically there's only one scientific name um, that refers to these animals. So we all know what we're talking about. Now, in terms of evolution, I'll say growing up in Arkansas, this was the part of our science book that the teacher flipped to and said, we're skipping that. And then we went to the next section. So I grew up with a kind of twisted mindset of what evolution was because especially in the South, there's a lot of schools that just skip over this entirely like it's some forbidden thing. And it's not. It's something that happens all around us. It's nature. And there's a lot of misconception about it because um, a lot of schools leave it out of their science education, which is, is such a shame because it's one of the coolest aspects of biology or, or zoology to learn about. And evolution isn't some crazy thing. It's not saying that we came from monkeys or we, we 
you know, we're just like chimps or anything like that. It's the fact that species can change over time to better suit their environments, which is pretty cool. I mean, if you're, if you're a Pokemon fan, you're probably an expert on some sort of evolution. <laughs> but unlike Pokemon, it's not something that happens like literally right in front of you. You're not going to be looking at a frog and that frog's like, it'd be really cool if I had wings and all of a sudden it grows wings and flies off. Um, that'd be really scary, honestly. Evolution's very slow. It happens over time, and it occurs to species, not individuals. So it's a, it's a big thing that happens. And it essentially explains all of the diversity that we have on our planet today. And that diversity is pretty crazy. It's a it's huge amount of um, variety in living things. And the craziest thing is that we still don't know just how many different species are out there. There's so much that we don't know about our planet in the present and in the past. That's because um, there's just so many hidden spots in the world that are just so difficult to get to. And this leads to why that range is so big on the screen. Because it's saying there's about 10 to 100 million different species on Earth, at least. There's probably way more than that. There's also diversity within a species. I mean, just look at all of us in this room. None of us, unless there's twins somewhere hidden out there, none of us are exactly alike. So there's diversity within species too. And all of that is a result of evolution and genetics. Now we're very quickly gonna go through this. This is where everybody's mind starts smoking because I'm like, I'm gonna pop through these slides so quick. Essentially how evolution works is species are overpopulated. More individuals are born that can survive. Sea turtles are a perfect example of this. It's like you crawl for your life as soon as you hatch. And uh, it's like something from a horror movie. You got seagulls diving down. You probably have like rats running across the beach. You know, everything's trying to kill you. And if you make it to the ocean, you think you're home free, but then there's sharks and there's fish, all sorts of things that are eating you there too. So they lay more eggs than um, what actually survives. So there's overpopulation. There's also competition. So our planet, let's just pretend humans aren't destroying the place, even if things were just hunky-dory, completely fine, there's limited resources. And some of those animals, they're gonna get their resources, all they need to survive, and they will make it, and some will not. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of variation among species. There's a lot of differences among individuals, and that's all a result of genetic mutations through DNA. And some of those genetic mutations give some individuals a slight advantage over the others. And those are what's known as favorable traits. Those favorable traits allow some of these animals to continue on and reproduce and keep their genetics out in the world. They're passing those favorable traits onto their offspring. And natural selection at its root, that is the mechanism of evolution. And uh, <laughs> I actually, my semester class for high schoolers started this week and one of them has pet rats, which we're all virtual still up, uh, up in Canada. And, uh, she was like, I can't look at this picture because it's so sad. <laughs> this is a very basic form of, of natural selection. So you have some sort of rat-like creature. I don't know. It's just a little sketch. I really don't know what they're supposed to be. Some blend in with their environment. Some stand out like a sore thumb. Those ones that stand out, predators pick off a lot easier. They don't pass on those genetics to their offspring. And what you get over time is the animals that are able to blend in better with their environment continue on and um, further the species. And eventually those changes, they build up. And that is what speciation is. For those of you that have ever taken a biology or zoology course, you're probably really familiar with these animals that you see right here. These are what a lot of people refer to as Darwin's finches. And it's what led Darwin to study evolution and learn more about it. Because when he went to the Galapagos, he was looking at these finches and he's like, they all kind of look the same, but they, they also look different. And what he was observing is that these finches, who had all descended from one species, like an ancestral seed-eating finch, they, over time, started seeking out other resources so they didn't have to compete with each other. So you saw some finches that evolved to eat bugs. You saw some that uh, evolved to eat more fruit, some that evolved to eat 
uh, large nuts, so they had a bigger beak, so they'd able to the crack it. And you saw a lot of variation that built it up over time. Now, adaptations, as I was mentioning, these are characteristics that help an animal survive in its environment. And they can be three different types. Some are structural, and that's what I refer to as the big teeth or the armored bodies. They can be chemical. That could be venom to better kill their prey or poison to keep predators away. There's also behavioral. Things like migrations, where animals learn to move uh, depending on the season. Some really cool adaptations that I love to talk about, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, is the camouflaging ability of octopuses. So they have these things called chromatophores, which we don't have time to go in full detail of how chromatophores work, but uh, they're like fluid-filled cells that can change color and shape depending on the octopus's environment and help them camouflage better to the point that sometimes they can look like coral. And the thing is, it's not just color, they can also change texture, which is pretty crazy. But it's an amazing, what was, the, what was that? Yay, tentacles. Yeah, see, <laughs> I knew there was going to be some, there's going to be things in here people are going to be like, start, you know, shaking their fists in the skies because they're so excited about. <laughs> Another adaptation that I love, 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 love to talk about is that of poison dart frogs. So in the natural world, predators have learned to avoid things that have crazy colors on them because more often than not, they are poisonous. Now, poison dart frogs, they get their poison from a specific type of ant or other insects, depending on the species that they eat. And those ants have certain types of chemicals with, within them that when they react with that dart frog's stomach, produces the poisonous secretion. So that's why, like with my dart frogs at my zoo, we feed them fruit flies and pinhead crickets. We don't feed them those ants. And if I wanted to, I could just pick them up with my hand and I would be completely fine. Which, of course, I don't do that. And it's not because I'm at a threat. It's because I could hurt the amphibian. Because if you guys don't know, amphibians breathe through their skin. Um, it's a very porous skin. And anything from your hand will go right into the amphibian's body. So you could think your hand is clean. I just washed my hands. It's completely fine. And then you have soap or hand sanitizer residue on your hand and it goes into that frog and, and kills it. So that frog is more at risk for me than I am from it. Now in the wild, that's a completely different story. You would get poisoned so bad if you just tried to pick these guys up. Um, physical adaptations can also manifest in a variety of different ways. It's not just those camouflaging abilities in the form of chromatophores. It could actually be the physical structure of an animal, like this praying mantis here, that has evolved to look like a leaf, which is pretty crazy. And there's, there's a lot of different animals, not just bugs, but also birds, that have adapted to look like the plants that they live around. Evolution doesn't always have to be... Um, animals competing for resources, it can be caused by an extreme geological event that causes species isolation. So for this example with these pork fish, which I honestly don't know why they're called pork fish. One of my students is trying to convince me it's because they taste like pork, but I don't know. Does any, anybody know anything about pork fish? You might. Yeah. Oh, that'd be really cool. So yeah, now, now you got my interest. For those of you that have followed my research, I study animal communication. That's what my PhD is in. So I know what I'm doing next, pork fish. <laughs> From tigers to pork fish, people are like, what happened? <laughs> um, but basically the Isthmus of Panama, it arose out of the ocean through geological activity about 3.5 million years ago. And these species were um, they were essentially separated. It was kind of like an ancestral one, one type of pork fish. And because of different environments on either side of Panama, they uh, changed over time. Now, when we're talking about evolution, we use things that are called cladograms. You may also know them as trees of life, um, which is kind of funny because Disney's Animal Kingdom has a, 
a literal tree of life with a lot of the animals in front of it. Um, but true trees of life, they're not that pretty. They're lines and lots and lots of lines. And we use this to depict evolution over time and how species have branched out from one another. Now, I won't go into this in too much detail just for the sake of time, but there's one very weird thing on this screen, and it's the shelled eggs and where exactly it is placed. Does anyone know why that's wrong? Yeah. They are. Yeah, reptile eggs are very different from bird eggs. That's very true. There's something else that uh, makes that wrong, too. Yeah. Yes, there are mammals that lay eggs. What's um, probably the most common one that people remember? With orange paws. Huh? Did you say, uh, so a mammal that lays eggs? Green ears. Yeah, the platypus. So yeah, platypus lay eggs. Uh, another animal that lays eggs is this little dude. So this is an echidna. And I used to work with these guys at the Dallas World Aquarium, which is pretty awesome. Um, just like platypus, they lay eggs. They also um, secrete the milk for their young or basically sweat it out onto their bellies, which is weird. What would you say? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the echidnas are just especially strange in all sorts of ways. If you've never seen that animal before, trust me, you probably have if you're in the Harry Potter world. So this is from Fantastic Beast, and they have a little magical creature called the Niffler, which is modeled after echidnas, just a magical form that loves to steal jewelry and shiny things. <laughs> so we have another tree of life here that I'd like to pose some questions about. And this is kind of like the, the metaphorical question. We'll get into the real ones later, but just take a look at this. We're going to see what conclusions could we draw about this tree and just kind of see where you guys are at in terms of understanding these a little bit. So our first question, did humans evolve from chimps? Yeah. yeah, no, but they had a common ancestor. Yeah. Are you in a zoology class right now? You will be. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a very good, I would give you like full points on that. <laughs> Extra points. That was a very good answer. Are humans more highly evolved than chimps? Yeah. You, yeah. Exactly. One of my biggest pet peeves as a zoologist is people that look at other animals like a rat or uh, a, I don't know, a little bird, and they like to tell humans as we're just this really highly evolved thing. Everything that we share this planet with, um, we, we've all been on this same pathway. We've all been evolving over time, and just because something doesn't have a laptop or know how to work this microphone or is able to speak like I do, it doesn't mean that they're any less evolved or less amazing than I am. They have evolved to be great at what they do. So it's just different, right? It's learning that, you know, everything's pretty cool. Um, and my final question, what human-based family term could we use to describe the relationship between humans and chimps? Yeah. Cousins, yeah, we're cousins with them. Um, and that's, I, I just love throwing this in here because this is one of the biggest misconceptions about evolution, especially our own pathway that we've had. And this is where things get really crazy. So we have 30 minutes to go through the whole animal kingdom. Are you guys ready for this now? Okay, we're going to try. We're going to try our best. So um, we're going to first start talking with um, what we call basal animalia. So like kind of the, the beginnings or, or the root of everything. And um, this is where things get weird. A lot of people don't realize that sponges are, are animals. But they absolutely... <laughs> <laughs> but they absolutely are. And for some time, in some places you can still see this, um, sponges that you would use in your house for cleaning or taking a bath or a shower, those were formerly living sponges, which is kind of creepy when you think about it. <laughs> Most sponges that you use in your house these days, unless you go to like um, a high quality like spa store or something like that, most of those are going to be synthetic, which 
in a way may be worse for the environment because of all the plastics, but that's, a, that's another topic for another day. Um, but sponges are living animals. Even though they lack tissues and organs, they are living animals. And they have all sorts of different cell types. Um, they have something called pachanocytes, which are on the outside of their body that basically help protect them. They form that physical structure. They have something called choanocytes, which are how they eat. So these are little cells that are able to grab food out of the water because they are filter feeders. And then in between those, they have something called mesophyll, which basically fill up that structure a bit more. Next to the sponges, we have the cnidarians, And I'm sure you, you know what these guys are, but anyone want to shout out what the cnidarians? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that is a man of war. So I know there's a lot on this slide, but now that we, we, I've called out this animal's attention, is a man of war a jellyfish? No. Oh my gosh. That's my star pupil right there. You guys have a lot to compete with right now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's what, uh, yeah, that's what man of wars are because, so jellies are. Typically, their own little living thing, but manowars, oddly enough, they are a colony of living organisms. That's what blows my mind. Like I look at, it, I was like, no, you that you can't tell me that that's more than one animal. That looks like one animal, and they're like, nope, it's a colony of polyps. So it's like, I don't know. I've been teaching this for several years, and I still look at that, and I'm like, no way. That's so crazy. And of course, a lot of you are probably like, tell me more about that, but we're running out of time. And once again, we could spend several classes just talking about man -of wars or cnidarians. But what's really cool about these guys is how simple they are. They still have some pretty complex muscles and not like us, like they're not able to do this. Like there's so many muscles in my arm and shoulder that is doing this. But these guys have two types of muscles. One is circular, which allows them to kind of expand and contract. They have the longitudinal one, which is able to stretch and contract in that way. So they're able to do quite a bit despite their more um, simple body plan. Nidarians are also things such as sea anemones, which yes, I said that correctly. Sometimes I, if I say it too quickly, I'm, it's like, it's like Dory and Finding Nemo and, uh, and all, all of them all over again. <laughs> Nidarians also include corals. And I just want to take a moment to talk about this terrible thing that's going on in our world's oceans right now that's called coral bleaching. Now, a lot of people think that coral bleaching, well, it's not that bad, like the coral is still there. But when that coral is still there, it, it's basically just, I mean, it's dead. It's, um, some of it can come back, but it is very difficult for it to come back. That's because corals, that color that is on a coral isn't just built into them. That coral is a type, or that color on a coral is a type of mutualistic algae called zooxanthellae, which basically allows that coral to live, feed, and exist. It's a mutualistic relationship. They benefit one another. And as oceans warm or acidify, which is terrifying to me. It concerns me that not more people are terrified that our ocean is literally becoming acid um, over time. Um, that acidification and those rising temperatures, it kills off this mutualistic algae. And as corals die, so do the reefs and all of the animals that depend on them. Because if you're not too familiar with reefs, they are nurseries for a lot of species or a permanent living area for a lot of other ocean species. The Great Barrier Reef is probably the one that has got the most attention for this, but it's happening to coral reefs all around the world at a, at a shocking rate. Um, essentially, our, our oceans are dying. This is the Great Barrier Reef that in the 90s, I mean, it was, it was slowly happening then, but it wasn't so much. I mean, I grew up knowing the Great Barrier Reef is this amazing, colorful place full of life, fish swimming everywhere. And now it's just mostly barren. And um, sometimes I, I just get really emotional thinking about, like I grew up in this world that if I ever have kids, they may not have that same world. And it's just gonna, if we don't do something, it's gonna keep going and going. 
Now, we're going to talk about a group that you guys are probably more familiar with, something that I feel like even elementary science talks about, and that is phylum analyta, which is the segmented worms, like earthworms. And to kind of give you guys a quick picture of where these guys are, maybe my mouse will sort of show up. Analyta is here. And surprising, there's about 12,000 species, approximately, of different types of worms. That's kind of, I'm not much of a worm person, so I don't know, it just kind of freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> and for those of you that were in drunk zoology uh, last night, you probably heard me talk about worm Twitter. There's people that study worms, and they get really riled up if you hate on worms. So if you're one of them, I'm very sorry, please don't come after me. <laughs> worms, worms are cool. <laughs> Now, in terms of um, annelids, they have still a pretty basic body plan, but not as basic as some of the others, like flatworms. Um, but it's, it's still pretty simple. And obviously, there's a lot to take in here, but it's mainly just for filler to uh, show you guys a little bit about what the inside looks like on these guys. Now, annelids have something called metameric segmentation, which means that they have these re repeated body segments uh, throughout their body, as also as they have something that's called compartmentalization, where their organs are in certain areas of their body. They also have some weird forms of movement. And I do have some kind of, I, they're not gross photos. There's nothing gory or anything. It's just like weird stuff like, this, which is a, a worm. <laughs> Most people don't realize, but earthworms actually have hair-like structures on their body. So they have these little hair-like structures, which you can kind of see on these rings here. And not only do they wiggle, but those hair-like bristles allow them to basically stay put in their environment and move, which is pretty neat. Now, there's a few different groups within Annelida. One is the Ligakita, which is the earthworms, and Hyrenidea, which is the leeches. All of the annelids have something that um, is pretty relatable to us, and that's that despite being so simple, they have a closed circulatory system as opposed to an open one, which things like grasshoppers or a locust, I'm not quite sure, uh, what they're intending that one to be. Um, but they have a, a, a pretty complex circulatory system. And what's really crazy and, and really cool is they actually have multiple hearts that are called auxiliary hearts. So they typically, depending on the species, have five of those, and then they have a main one. So next time you look at an earthworm, I mean, just, I don't know. I'm one of those people, I get emotionally attached to anything, even earthworms, even though I said I, I didn't quite like them. <laughs> That's what I get for being an empath. Um, but after I learned all these things about earthworms, I just see them all in a different light, right? Like when you start to learn just how complex they are, it's no longer just a little wiggly thing on the ground. There's so much more to them. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> I had this slide in here because... Um, there was a lot of my students in the past that hated leeches, and I like to throw in dramatic slides where it's like leech time, and then they all scream because they hate learning about them. Leeches are pretty crazy creatures. Um, they have more than one brain. They can control each end of their body independently. Um, they have hooks that are able to clasp onto their prey, and they're actually amazingly helpful. Even to this day, we use them in the medical system. Not as commonly in the past, but we still do to some extent. So they're used for a lot of uh, blood-related treatments because of the anti-coagulating um, properties that is in their saliva, which is pretty neat. Once again, there's so much research about these guys, so little time to talk about them. Now this is, <laughs> I'm just going to preface this. When I was teaching this on Twitch, for those of you that are familiar with Twitch, there's things such as channel points. And the more that people watch your streams, the more points that they get. And if this person is in this room, they're probably going to start, like, they're going to call themselves out on this. Um, one of my students on Twitch collected a lot of points. And I don't know, I guess they just knew there was going to be a moment where they didn't want to hear about something. And it came to this. Um, 
I've never had anybody use channel points to ban a word before where I wasn't allowed to talk about it, but it happened because of a few, like within a few more slides, um, there's something pretty terrifying <laughs> that we're gonna talk about. One of my students immediately banned it. Yeah. What was it? Doc? Dog? I can't hear. <laughs> G eight, I cannot hear you guys. I'm so sorry. T. Okay, I have no idea. This is so much. I, I'm I'm so glad we're all wearing masks, but it just makes it so difficult. I. The. Oh my god. Okay, I don't know what's going on anymore, but we're gonna move on. So we have a. Oh my God, okay. Teiji, okay, we're just gonna move on. I really don't know what's going on at this point. Oh my gosh. So within Analytics, <laughs> there um, is a group called Polyketa. And this is the largest group, which is quite terrifying because they are, they're pretty terrifying to, <laughs> to look at. Um, what's crazy about these guys is they have parapodia, which is essentially little leggies that are all over their body. And honestly, this is, they're creepy, but this is a very beautiful photo. Like the photographer that took this um, took it in some amazing detail. But um, they have a lot of detail to them. Um, they can move quite efficiently because of their, their little feet. And this is a <laughs> this is what my uh, my little Twitch viewer banned because um, I'm not going to show the video because I don't have time. But uh, this is a bobbit worm. Um, we call them the predators of the deep. They're very long creatures, and they can pop out of the sand and grab even things that are multiple times their size. Um, my Twitch viewers banned Bobbit Worm, Bobbit, and Bobby the Worm, as well as Bobby, because they, I was finding ways around the word ban as we were going through this. These guys are quite terrifying, but I highly recommend that you look up some videos of them because they're just, it's really cool to watch. Robert? Robert the Worm. I'm going to do that. Thank you. Thank you for the su suggestion. My Twitch viewers won't be happy with that, but I will be. I will be very much happy. Now, Phylum Mollusca. This is when you start to get into things that most people recognize as, as animals. And Mollusca has some amazing diversity to it. So this thing, um, this includes slugs. It includes snails. It also includes things like squids, cuttlefish, and octopi. Now, within this group, there's also some things that a lot of people forget are still living on our planet, like nautilus. So nautilus are living, essentially like a living remnant of a prehistoric species known as ammonites, which you will often see in depictions of uh, prehistoric oceans. Um, they're amazing animals. They are also um, very, very threatened out in the wild because they are such sensitive creatures. And very rarely will you find these guys in aquariums because they thrive in deeper waters with higher pressure. And it's really hard to replicate that in uh, an aquarium without a, a pressure chamber. I was very fortunate to work in an aquarium that has some Nautilus and we were actually um, able to breed them and, and keep young in the aquarium, which was pretty, pretty awesome. There's also another group within... Um, within the cephalopods that are the squids, very amazing creatures. And kind of relating back to that nautilus, all of the organisms within uh, cephalopoda and mollusca in general, they all originally had shells. Eventually, these guys lost it over time. But what's really strange is squids actually still have part of that shell, which a lot of people don't realize. But... Um, Within a squid, they have something called a pin, which is just a weird plastic-like structure that's deep within their body is like a support system. And that is remnants of when squids had shells like our little Nautilus friend. So there's still remnants of that within them. Cuttlefish also still have remnants of a shell too, and this is where people get really weirded out. Does any, anyone have pet birds? Have you guys ever bought cuddle bones? Yeah, cuddle bones are from cuttlefish. 
<laughs> now there are there are some um, uh, synthetic versions because all it is is basically like a calcium buildup. So it, not all of it is from a cuttlefish, but um, a lot of it is. So which is he looks so sad in this photo, um, his little eye. <laughs> yeah, cuttle bones. That's a remnant of their shell. Their locomotion is pretty dang awesome too. They do it through jet propulsion, so they're able to pull water into their bodies and just like use that to launch out. It's especially really cool to see in a Nautilus because they just kind of float through the water. You don't see any movement other than just them moving, and it's kind of creepy, <laughs> creepy to watch. Now, of course, octopus, um, incredibly intelligent. They're the most well-known group of these guys. And here we are with those chromatophores that I was hinting at earlier. So these are essentially little fluid-filled sacs throughout their body that are able to camouflage, change texture, and shape. So that's what all these little dots are that you see here. Now we're back a little bit to some animals that you typically wouldn't consider animals, and that's these, yeah, rotifers. So these are the smallest multicellular organisms out there. They do some pretty amazing things. One of those is something called anhydrobiosis, which is just a fancy way of saying that they can survive extreme environments. Essentially, this type of it is they can live through a whole area completely drying out, and they don't die. And then when the water or rain comes back, they're able to spring back to life. There's also, and I couldn't remember if I put any of the slides in here, um, Next to this group, of course, are things like water bears or the tardigrades, which are even able to survive things like the extremes of space, which is pretty crazy to think about. This is the group that I'm always very careful to talk about because some scientists take this, take this group really personally if you insult them. Um, this is Phylum platyhelminthes. You probably also know them as flatworms. And yeah, flatworms, they're pretty cool. I don't hate on them, I just, if I had the option to study flatworms or tigers, I would study the tigers, but there would be some flatworm scientists out there will just lose their mind if you even suggested that. And that's because these guys are model organisms. They contribute to a lot of an amazing research just because of how amazing their body plans are. Uh, what's, what's really crazy about these guys, <laughs> I would never do it because I always feel so bad, you can cut them in half and they just grow, they just, they, they'll grow another head or grow back and grow the rest of their body, which is pretty crazy. So in terms of cell biology and regenerative growth and all sorts of like human health implications, they are an amazing organism to use in those studies. This is the group which, I don't know, it's not purposeful, I swear, but somehow every time we get to this group, that class falls on like, the week of American Thanksgiving, and everybody's so mad. Because if you guys don't recognize this, this is a tapeworm. <laughs> so this is class Cestoda. Um, tapeworms are, they're incredibly gross. I, I won't spend too much time on them, but they have some amazing properties to them in the fact that every little segment can become another tapeworm. It is nasty. <laughs> and that's what makes them so terrifying and, and hard to get rid of in animals. It's, it's why it's so important that you take your animals to the vet and get their regular like dewormer and such like that um, because it keeps them healthy. It's not just tapeworms, it's all sorts of other worms like groundworms and especially heartworms and such like that. Um, so this next group is called Panarthropoda. And my good friend Intobird is going to be really mad at me because I'm just very quickly going to talk about them and then we're going to move on. But Intobird could make a whole panel just about these groups. The reason why I'm, I'm just going to move on is this, this is everything that's within Panarthropoda. It's a lot. So it includes things like horseshoe crabs, it includes scorpions, spiders, all the way to centipedes and millipedes, and uh, things like the tardigrades. There's a lot within panarthropoda. Um, so these little guys that I was hinting at earlier, they also go through a form of anhydrobiosis where they're able to survive extreme environments. I already gave away the spoiler for this, but they're able to survive the vacuum of space, which is pretty dang cool. And uh, 
I honestly just don't see it. A lot of people are like, they're called water bears because they look like bears. And I look at it and I, I just don't know. But if you see that, good for you, I guess. <laughs> but it's just weird. They're, they're, but they're cute, right? Cute in a weird way. Now, within Panarthropoda, just to very quickly talk about these guys, this is subphylum Chislerata, which includes things like the spiders. Now, these animals, they don't have lungs like we do, but they do have lungs, which a lot of people don't realize. And those lungs are often referred to as book lungs because when you look at a, like a cross section, if you were to slice it open, it looks like pages of a book. And that's how they're able to carry out respiration and essentially breathe. It's not quite the same as ours where we pull in oxygen and our lungs are able to inflate and deflate and we keep breathing and such, but it still um, carries in oxygen to their blood throughout their body. Now, in terms of the diversity of panarthropoda, they make up a huge chunk of diversity on our planet. That's another reason why I'm only able to briefly touch on them because we're running out of time on these guys and we have an hour for a whole semester class. But if you are interested in bugs, I do recommend following one of my best friends, uh, Intobird, on Twitter. They are an entomologist. They live up in Canada with me. And th uh, thankfully, with COVID sort of settling down up in Canada a little bit, uh, we do hope to make videos and content together since we actually live nearby each other. So that would be really awesome and something to look forward to for all of you. Now, I said that we were just going to be, we're through with all the things that you wouldn't consider animals, but here's some that are sneaking back in. And these are the echinoderms, or things like Kevin the sea cucumber here. Now, Kevin the sea cucumber kind of lives infamously within my Discord server and Twitch because um, I don't know what it was. I pulled up this slide during one of my Twitch streams, and my computer just fritzed out and this like froze and was just taking over the whole stream. So I'm sorry if you were ever watching. I was like freaking out and it was after a really long day. It was like my work Friday and I was so tired and Kevin was on there. But um, if you ever attend any of my zoology classes on in any form, I, as a 90s kid, I'm obsessed with SpongeBob and Actually, there's a lot of things within SpongeBob that were right. Like, there's a lot of really cool facts, such as Kevin here. Now, I don't, I can't tell you if there's any sea cucumbers out in the ocean that run jellyfish fan clubs. I don't know. Maybe. But they do have um, some amazing properties to them. And one, I don't think I have um, a photo of it, but this little crown that's on his head that actually exists on sea cucumbers and that's how they go through respiration. So in the show, it makes it look like he's wearing a little crown because he thinks he's uh, tough and he's the, the head of this fan club. But sea cucumbers do have it. In real life, they look something like this. I don't know. Sort of looks like a cucumber. Yeah. They do. And you're in luck because that is one photo. So that's what's going on right here. <laughs> So when sea cucumbers get real freaked out, they just throw up their insides. Can you imagine, like, someone scares you and you just puke out your intestines? That's what these guys do. And then they're fine. They don't, like, they're fine, right? If we did that, that'd be real bad. Like, I'm not a human doctor, but I have a feeling that you would not make it out of that situation. <laughs> but sea cucumbers, completely fine. Starfish are also pretty dang amazing. They're able to lose their arms and regenerate them. Um, they have some amazing features throughout their body. Um, they're able to pull water into their bodies through multiple pores. They have little tiny legs that they're able to move. Um, and for some reason, people still don't see them as animals, but they are. Another critter that a lot of people don't think are animals are sea urchins. So this is a living organism. A lot of them are also... Um, pretty chill. They're not always poisonous or, or sorry, venomous, um, but they can hurt you if you if you just grab them, which I've experienced when I used to monitor a touch tank at my former aquarium. Kids are like, oh, that's cool, and they just grab it. Doesn't work out. Doesn't work out for the kid. But what's really neat about sea urchins is they have something from like alien inside of their bodies. So this is referred to as Aristotle's lantern, and this is the teeth of a sea urchin. 
Yes, they have teeth. And that's what they use to grind up algae and other bits of food that they're eating. Now, when it comes to all the animals that we typically consider animals, so like what most people have as sonas and, and animals that we care for at home, um, things that set us apart and other related organisms apart is something that we call chordates. So we belong to a group of animals called chordates, which is a few characteristics that link them all together. Um, the most common one that people refer to is the dorsal hollow nerve cord, which in us eventually becomes our spinal cord. And um, there's, there's other characteristics, of course, but we have seven minutes. We're going to try and get through this here. So we're just going to skip through here. Um, because of this guy, we have to wake up and go to work every day. This is uh, Tiktaalik, which is... Um, the ancestor of all terrestrial organisms. Um, because he decided one day to crawl out on land, now we have to go to work. <laughs> um, and of course, it wasn't just one individual that led to that. It was a process over time, as we talked about later. There's a lot of animals that led up to that point, of course. Things like lungfish, which still exist to this day. Coelacanth, which also still exists to this day. Uh, we often refer to them as living fossils because they still have such... Um, they basically still look like they did at the beginning of, of their existence, which is, is pretty cool. Now, things like Tiktaalik and, and all of those early terrestrial ancestors is what eventually led to the world of amphibians. And amphibians quite literally translates to two lives. So they have a life in the water, they have a life on the land. And although they are land animals, they still depend on that water for survival. Now, you have things like frogs and toads that most people are familiar with. You also have salamanders, and something that a lot of people aren't familiar with are things called um, Sicilians, which look like worms, but they are amphibians, and they are um, very, very creepy. Something that a lot of people are terrified about Sicilians is the fact that they eat their mother's skin when they're born. I don't know. Animals are weird. <laughs> So we have an uh, order in urine, the frogs and toads. They have some amazing life cycles within them. Salamanders, they have a very ancestral body plan. What's really neat about them is that they start out in a weird larval form and eventually are able to grow into that adult form that has a life on land. What's one exception to this? Axolotls. Yeah, axolotls. So axolotls, um, and once again, this is just me joking around. It's not like a, axolotls made this decision. But axolotls were like, oh, it's kind of cool to stay in this larval form. Let's just, let's just do this. And they do that. <laughs> um, but there is some truth to that. So evolutionary, they found a, a little spot to fill in those ecosystems within, by staying in the bodies of water. And they stay in that, that baby form, which is really, really cute. Sicilians, they are such amazing animals, but very creepy. Like I said, I should have just put eat their mother's skin on there because that will make people remember who they are. <laughs> yeah. Now, in terms of aminotes or amniotes, these guys are the animals that are like us. So they're able to produce amniotic eggs um, in various different forms. So even though we don't lay eggs, we still produce that. Uh, we still produce amniotic eggs within us. All the other animals, uh, reptiles and birds and such, they all have different forms of this egg, of course. In terms of skulls within these animals, there's actually a surprising amount of diversity. Uh, for us, we have something called a synapsid skull. Anapsid usually refers to things like turtles and some other ancestral animals. Diapsid are things like the reptiles and birds. And what those names refer to is the amount of skull openings behind the eye. And that's usually where nerves and other muscles attach. Once again, that could be a semester course on its own. Now I put reptiles question mark here because we still, for the most part, refer to reptiles as belonging to class reptilia. But this group is something that we refer to in zoology as paraphyletic, which means that that group doesn't include technically all of the descendants or all the related organisms. Um, how could we fix that? What would we group into here that would make that more accurate? What's related to reptiles? 
Birds. I heard a few people shouting it. Yeah. So there's a lot of back and forth in the scientific community that birds should be lumped in with reptiles. They shouldn't be two different classes. They should be together because they are uh, very closely related. What's really neat about them and kind of gross as someone that cleans up after these animals at my purely reptile zoo, um, they don't poop and pee like we do. 